Our final speaker before we uh, open the floor to your questions is the Honourable Justice Brian J. Preston, SC, Chief Judge, Land and Environment Court of New South Wales. Brian. <laughs> Well, what a wonderful thing. All you guys coming along in an evening to talk about uh, citizen participation in our uh, environmental and planning system and how we achieve better outcomes. That's, that's a wonderful thing. It's uh, uh, good to see. Now, why do we do it all? Well, really at the heart of why people come to things like this, go along and make uh, submissions to governments, local, or state or federal, is because we have a sense that we want to achieve justice, environmental justice. Now when we say we're going to achieve environmental justice, what do we mean by that? You can see at least three ways. One is the concept of distributive justice. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about the distribution of environmental benefits and burdens. There are going to be some benefits, for example, in development, employment, houses for people. There will be goods produced from factories. But there are burdens that come with that as well. All those externalities, the traffic, the noise, the um, pollution that comes, the loss of environmental space, species. And the question is, how are they distributed, those benefits and burdens? And often, of course, what happens is there's an unfair distribution of those benefits. Certain groups in society get all the benefits, but others get the burdens. Mm -hmm. That's the injustice that people worry about. Mm -hmm. So when people are labelled NIMBYs and they say they don't want it in their backyard, they may be saying there's distributive injustice here. We're getting the burdens, but others are getting the benefits. Mm -hmm. And that's what's unfair. A second way we can think about environmental justice is procedural justice. That's the right to participate in the polity. We've moved away from the technocratic, paternalistic, top-down approach that we know what's good for you and this is what the, will happen to say that's not part of democracy. We should have an opportunity to participate in that. And procedural justice involves, firstly, having access to all relevant information. Yeah. You can't participate if you don't get the information. <laughs> the second is that you have meaningful opportunities to participate. Not tokenistic, not sort of we'll tell you about it, but you don't get an opportunity to respond. <laughs> Meaningful opportunities to participate. I'll come back to that and as to how we can do that a bit better. And of course, if those procedural rights to have access to information, the right to know what's going on, and the right to participate, have an input into decision-making processes, if they're infringed, the opportunity to go to courts or other tribunals to complain, mm. to uphold your rights, that's absolutely vital, that access to justice. So these are ways of procedural justice. And when people say that they've lost those opportunities, they haven't been given the information, they haven't been consulted, they haven't 
<coughs> being able to participate in a meaningful way. And they haven't been able to go to the court to be able to complain about that. That's where people rightly say there's been procedural injustice. And the third way you can look at justice is by way of recognition. Now, this is an interesting one. It's not dependent only on procedural justice or distributive justice. Everyone is equal before the law. Everyone has equal worth. My say is as good as your say. My right to participate is as good as your right to participate. My right to have access to environmental benefits and not to have all of the burdens is as good as the next person's. And that needs to be recognised. And what we see in society is lack of recognition of certain sectors in, so in society, misrecognition, that is recognition, but it's wrongful, and malrecognition, that is where they're actually starting to target in a malevolent way particular people or sections of the good society. Now when people use labels like NIMBY, it's never done in a praiseworthy manner, is it? It denigrates. In rugby terms, it's playing the man, not the ball. But what you're saying when you label somebody a NIMBY is what that person is saying is not worthwhile listening to. We want to write that off right at the start. Why? Because they're a NIMBY. And if you want to play with any of the other labels, bananas, lulus, fruits, it doesn't matter. They're all designed to denigrate. Now you'll see that. When the groups take action, they get in the press. The powerful in society will try to denigrate them. Not go to deal directly with their arguments, but denigrate the people. This is injustice in recognition. So what we want to do we need to address that. We need to recognise that all are worthwhile and we need to find where that is. Where are the laws? Where are the policies? Where are the practices that are leading to this injustice in recognition? So when people are participating in a process and they're calling out and saying, this is what I think has been the injustice. Perhaps we can see elements of each of those three ways that I've said lying at the heart of what they are saying is the injustice. So how can we do things better? Well, it's going to take me more than 10 minutes. <laughs> or the few that I've got left. But one of the things I just I'll pick out just a few. So if we're looking at applications that fall under, for example, the Environmental Plan Assessment Act, so there's an application for a particular project and approval. We can break that process down into these stages: the application <coughs> stage, the assessment stage, the approval stage, and the implementation stage. Let's just pick a few things from each of those stages. So let's take the application stage. One of the problems is that the current laws do not require any engagement with the community until the application is made. At that stage, the developer has already locked in the particular project. They're committed to it. So the opportunities for the public, the community, to participate are constrained 
Because they're not going to come up with, if the community said, well, yes, I'm not opposed to having this particular development, but wouldn't it be much better at a different site? Developer says, well, that might be all very well, but I bought this site. <laughs> I'm not going elsewhere. Or, I've already spent a lot of money on having these plans drawn up by a very expensive architect. And I've paid engineers and all these other consultants and I've done all these environmental impact assessments. And no, <laughs> you know, I can tweak the edges and paint it a different colour, but I'm not going to change the whole thing. <laughs> That's equality. Right, that's where we've got to uh, keep, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. But so one of the things we need to do is to go and engage the community at a much earlier stage so that they have a real opportunity to participate. And there are various ways we can do that. In the assessment stage, we can find that at the moment it's rather perfunctory as to how the community's views are taken into account. For one thing, they don't actually go and ask the people. <coughs> so the assessors, the people who are preparing those assessments, try to assess what the community might think, what might be their concerns, without actually finding out what they really are. And I can assure you that in the three ways that I've talked about, you'll really see an assessment of those justice issues about the equity in the distribution of benefits and burdens, about how to engage procedurally the, the community, or about how recognising the, the worth of the community that's going to be affected. At the approval stage, one of the problems is that there tends to be a pro forma approach. You might have made all those submissions and put them all in. And they may be catalogued, put into categories. There were 300 submissions. They fell generally into the categories of traffic, noise, planning, um, environment. <coughs> but they won't actually engage with what it is. There's a disconnect between what you say and how they deal with them. Though it's not a proper assessment of what the community is saying. The final point, and that's because I'll get another wind up, is in the implementation stage. Why do we think that public participation stops at the assessment stage, the application stage. Why don't we continue to engage the community after an approval is given and after a development is being carried out? That is a vital stage and the community can continue to be involved. And it's in the interests of developers, particularly for projects that do continue, they're not one-off ones, because that's where they get their social license. That's where they, the community accepts the legitimacy of the business that is carrying out that development. By continuing to engage at those later stages, the community uh, approves and gives that license to the uh, developer. And the community can continue to offer opportunities uh, which will benefit the, the development. And of course, we can continue the distributive justice, procedural justice, and justice's recognition by continuing to engage the community at a later stage. Thank you.